Good morning, happy Monday. This is what it's come to, let me show you. Boredom busters. This is what it's come to. I am going stir crazy. I know a lot of good is gonna come out of this, but I think a lot of us are gonna be a little crazy by the end of this. Yeah, it's just a struggle. I'm trying to get outside as much as possible these days. Like when the weather's nice, I'm trying to get out. And uh, yeah, but I just, I'm going crazy. I actually saw something really kind of neat today. Um, there's a photographer couple that I follow and they're stinking cute, but the husband posted this morning that he watched a video that Bob Goff did. I don't know if you guys know who Bob Goff is, but anyway, he said, we're doing this like adults, but to make it fun, figure out something that you loved to do when you were eight years old and do that now. I was like, what did I love when I was eight? And it's kind of, I don't know. I loved Legos, so maybe I'll buy a Lego set and play with some Legos. I don't know. I loved coloring. I do have a coloring book and crayons that I keep here for when I have kids come over. So maybe I'll color later. Um... Yeah, so what would you do as an eight-year-old that you can do right now? This photographer guy, Jordan, he bought a pair of rollerblades, and he's been rollerblading, <laughs> and he said that it's super fun. So that's awesome. If I rollerbladed, first of all, I would kill myself, and second of all, I would absolutely kill myself in my neighborhood because it's like this. The hills are like crazy. He lives in Arizona, and it's flat. Anyway, so maybe I'll get me some Legos and start playing with some Legos when I get bored. I don't know. I would love to know what you would do as an eight-year-old to occupy your time. I should be a professional at being bored. I'm an only child, so I always had to occupy myself, but it's just harder as an adult, isn't it? It's harder to be creative and have fun and be bored, and yeah, and I think today's psalm fits in perfectly with that. <laughs> I could probably still rollerblade. I just don't want to. <laughs> I never enjoyed it. I liked skating. Now, roller skating, I loved. I used to go roller skating all the time. I had the white leather roller skates with the pink pom-pom and the pink laces and the pink wheels. Girl, who are you talking about? Anyway, I think the whole boredom thing and like our just adult brain is like, we have to be working. We have to be doing things. Um, I think that fits in perfectly with today's psalm. At least it does for me. It speaks to me. We're going to dig into Psalm 127. All right. Bible's at the ready. Middle, Psalm 127. Here we go. A song of ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. In vain you get up early and stay up late, working hard to have enough food. Yes, he gives sleep to the one he loves. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born in one's youth. Happy is the man who has filled his quiver with them. They will never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gate. Okay, this is kind of a weird one, right? All right. So first of all, the first thing that you'll probably notice is that this is the first one from Solomon. It says, a song of ascents of Solomon. So this is King David's son who wrote this, or some people think David may have written it about his son, Solomon. We don't know for sure, but it's either written by Solomon or written for Solomon. So we'll go with that, but that's who Solomon is. He was King David's son. So let's, we're going to break this down into two sections. So the first section is the first two verses where he's talking about if you build a house or you watch over a city or you do anything in vain, you're doing, or if you do anything without the Lord, you're doing it in vain. So in order to be fruitful, God has to be in everything that we do. That's the big takeaway from these first couple of verses. In order for us to do anything that means anything, it needs to be done with the Lord. He's in charge. He needs to be at the center of everything that we do. Now, that's not to say that people who don't put God at the forefront of their lives aren't going to be successful. There are a lot of people, I'm sure, who are not believers who make a lot of money. But 
there's a certain purpose to our lives and to everything that we do when God is at the center of it. And that purpose might not even be something that we see in our lifetime. It's just something that God knows and he's using us as a vessel. So the psalmist here is not saying don't work hard. He's saying work hard with God at the focus, with God as the center of everything that you do. So, um, This tells me that we are participants in God's plan. And we've seen this in previous Psalms that we've studied, right? God wants us to participate in his plan. Working is not bad, but working for our own glory is in vain. Um, Let's see, I've said someone who works thinking things will fall apart without them cannot rest. I think this is what speaks to me most about these first two verses. Pre-coronavirus, I was noticing for the last however long that hustle is a big deal, right? Glad to hear that thought that we may be cognizant of the purpose in our time. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen this whole hustle mindset where that's kind of what we glorify, right? Where everybody is like, I don't know. It's kind of like the thing you say when you see a friend of yours out in the grocery store and you're like, oh, how are you? And they're like, oh, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. It's like that's a badge of honor these days if you're busy, if your planner is packed to the gills with stuff to do and you're just always busy and you're always hustling. And, you know, that's kind of our society's mindset. And I kind of almost feel like this whole coronavirus thing where we're having to slow down, we're being forced to rest um, is really healthy. It's hard for a lot of us because it's a complete shift from what we're used to, but it's very healthy. And I think it helps us focus on things that are truly important. And God is telling us through this psalmist that all that work that we do, if we're just staying busy, we're forgetting to check in with him and go, hey, God, what do you want me to be doing? You know, um, It has been a gift, Roxana. This quarantine has absolutely been a gift is this rest that we're getting. And yes, we are getting bored. We're starting to get cabin fever and go stir crazy, but it's still a gift. And we don't hear God when we're so busy. So this forced slowdown is forcing us to just sit and be quiet and to listen. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to realize that it's okay to work. It's okay for us to work hard but we need to be working hard for his will, for his purpose, and not for our own glory. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we're hearing from God. There's a difference between praying to God and listening. Um, and I don't think any of us, and myself included, I don't think any of us take the time often enough to just sit and be quiet and listen to God. I pray a lot. I pray constantly. I talk to God all day but I'm talking. I'm not listening. And you know, your mama said this, I'm sure God gave you two ears and one mouth. You're supposed to listen more than you speak. We don't do that, especially when it comes to God. And so this solitude and this time of rest is a great opportunity for us to just close our mouths and open our ears and hear from God and what he wants us to be working on. And we can work hard toward his purpose and not ours. And hopefully when all of this coronavirus stuff and self-isolation is over, we will work harder for him than we were working before for ourselves. So that's the first part of this. Pretty much everything that we do for work, it needs to be done for him. It needs to be with God as the focus, not our own glory. And something that I love is this last, the second verse, the end of the second verse, it says, yes, he gives sleep to the one he loves. I want you to think about something for just a minute. When you, pre-coronavirus, when you are working really hard, did you ever feel guilty for taking a break or a day off? Why was that? Most of us do. Most of us feel guilty when we aren't, when we're not working. And I think a lot of that is because we feel like the world is going to end. Our world is going to end if we stop, if we rest, if we sleep. And I think we have to remember that one of the Ten Commandments is to take a Sabbath and to rest, to just fully rest. And that is a full surrender to God. When we sleep, 
We are completely vulnerable. Anybody could do anything to us when we're sleeping. And what we have to remember is, at this point in our lives, we've gone to sleep every single night since we were born, and the world did not end. God kept things spinning, even when we rested. And so I think it's really important for us to remember that it says, yes, he gives sleep to the one he loves. He doesn't want us to just work and work and work. He wants us to work and rest and work and rest and have that natural rhythm in our lives because the work is never done and I don't deserve it. Also concerned what my husband will say when I fall short. See, that's a normal feeling. And I think I've said this before, but I really think women feel this more than men. Men are able to shut things off and compartmentalize a little bit better, but women, we work our job and then we work as moms and we work as wives and we, you know, we work all the time. And so when we do take a day or even just a few hours to just stop, we do feel guilty. But God's saying not to do that. He's got this. He's saying he gives sleep to the one he loves. We saw this back in, if you'll flip over a couple pages back to Psalm 121 verse 4. What does it say there? It says, indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. He doesn't sleep. He lets us do that. He's like, I've got the night watch. You guys take a break. All good. Everything's going to be right here when you get back. The world isn't going to fall apart. It's fine. Just rest. You need it. Right? That's what he's saying. I love that so much. And that's a great reminder for me because I'm very much a doer. It's very hard for me to rest. I've been practicing the Sabbath since like middle of December where I'll take one full day off every week and that's my rest. And I spend a lot of time in prayer and journaling and just sitting with God on those days and it has been so good for my spirit. But it's definitely a practice. I'm not great at it. Um, So that's the first two verses. The second or the last three verses have to do with our families. So he talks about how sons or children are a heritage from God. They're a heritage. I love that word heritage from the Lord. Our offspring are a reward. Roxana says, her version says, it it is vain for you to rise early and put off your rest at night. I'd say every mama needs this reminder. Yes, because it's not all about us. It's not about us. Um. So our children, our families, our offspring, they are a reward. How relevant is that right now, guys? A lot of us are having to spend a lot of time with our families that we don't normally spend, right? Even though we love them and they live with us, it's a lot of time, a lot of quality time with people that are related to us and they're probably starting to get on our last nerve. (laughs) But our families are a reward. Uh, So... In Jewish culture, families are like the prominent thing. And especially sons, they, they would believe that the more boys you had, the more blessed the Lord would make you. Like you were blessed by having all these boys. God love a duck. I mean, I'm telling you. I only have one and she's a girl and I'm so thankful. Um, <laughs> no one's gone missing. So, but the Lord is saying that our families are a blessing. And I love this in verse four. It says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born in one's youth. Think about an arrow, okay? You have an arrow. If you have ever shot a bow and arrow, what do you have to do? You pull it back and you point it in the right direction. Wherever you want it to go, you point it at the right target and you let it go. And you have no more control. And I think that imagery for our children is so powerful because we spend our lives raising our kids to be the kind of people that we hope that they will be, right? And we're going to point them in the right direction as much as possible. But once we let go, they're on their own. Strong wind might kick up. Another arrow might come and bump them off track. A bird might, I mean, who knows? All kinds of stuff could happen. But we are in charge of them until we let them go. And then we have to just like let God handle it at that point. I have a daughter who just turned 18 and she's going off to University of Georgia in the fall. And I'm at that letting go part. And it is really hard. It's really hard. But that's what he's saying. It's like, you've done your job and now I've got it and you have to just let me do it. It says, happy is the man who has filled his quiver with them. 
If you have lots of kids, you are super blessed and that is awesome. And I know Roxana, for you with your four, that might feel like you are not very blessed right now <laughs> with all of them being at home, but the family is a blessing. Um, also back to the whole arrow metaphor, arrows can be used for good or evil and how we raise them. If we keep God at the center of our family, we are putting them on a very strong, straight path. But if God is not in it, just like if he's not in our work and not in our rest, it's in vain. And those arrows that we fire can be used for evil instead of for good. So we have to make sure that God is at the focus and the center of our family as much as it is our work as well. It says they will never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gate. So just a fun fact, all throughout scripture, especially in the Old Testament, you'll see a lot of meetings happen at the city gates. That's where like all the big doings were done because they needed witnesses. So they would meet at the city gate and there was also this whole thing where they their agreement, instead of a handshake, they would hand somebody a shoe. They're like, here's my shoe. We're agreeing to this. That's just a fun fact. That has nothing to do with anything today, but I just find that really interesting. They would give their shoe, their sandal, to whoever they made a deal with, and that would be like their signed contract. Um, so, but this is just saying that if we raise our kids right, they're going to make smart decisions. Let's keep God at the focus of our family and the focus of our work, and we're all going to make better decisions. We're all going to end up being more on the right path. He's going to guide us and point us where we're supposed to go. And we don't have to worry about being in control of it. He's got it. He's got all of this. So it's in vain for us to do anything without God, whether it's work or rest or raise a family or take care of our house or whatever. It's in vain to do it without him. But by focusing on him, we're letting him know that we trust him and that he's in control and we can rest easy at night knowing that God's got this. And we're all good. So there you go. I thought this was a fantastic psalm today, especially as we're starting the third week of this self-isolation thing and we're all starting to get a little stir crazy and maybe we're starting to feel like we're missing out on stuff or our work is falling to the wayside or whatever. I think this is a very good reminder that these are blessings. These are all blessings from the Lord. So let's keep our eyes focused on Him and keep Him at the center of everything that we do. And I did love what I was talking about at the very beginning of the live today, if you missed it, but find something that you loved to do when you were eight years old and do that today or do it this week and uh, have fun. Have fun this week. I'm going to go order some Legos on Amazon <laughs> and play with some Legos and color in my coloring book and just, yeah. But also take a minute today to just sit quietly if at all possible, with your four kids, Roxana, Find a quiet place. Just sit quietly and listen for what God has to say to you today. Thank you. These psalms have become part of my daily quiet time. I love that, Julie. Yay. I posted um, on my Instagram stories last night. I would love for you guys to go respond to it. But when we finish these next Monday, we'll do Holy Week through Easter and then I would love to keep doing some stuff, even if it's not every day, if it's just a couple days a week or something or Monday through Friday, I don't know, whatever that looks like. But I would love for you guys to go back to my Instagram story before it expires and just tell me what you want to study next. If there's a topic or if there's a book of the Bible that you want to do chapter by chapter or, you know, if there's like a series of events or a person or whatever, like if there's something that you want to study like this, I love these little bite-sized daily studies. They definitely have been life-giving to me and they're holding me accountable because I know that you guys are coming and um, I, I think they've been great and I'm going to miss it when it's over. So let's keep it going. I would love for you guys to tell me what you want to, what you want to talk about. So um, I hope you guys have a fantastic Monday um, and I will talk to you tomorrow. I'll be back at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. So I'll see you then. Bye.